Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. When the NHL expanded for the 1967-68 season, they went west, and they added teams in Los Angeles, Vancouver, and the Oakland area with the Golden Seals. The Seals didn't last very long in Oakland for a myriad of reasons, and they relocated. The crazy thing about the relocation is that the team's owner decided to move the Seals to a city he had never visited and to a city in which he never did any research to see if the city would support the team. It was sort of like throwing a dart at a map. And no matter where that dart landed, that's where he was moving. And next, on Sports Forgotten Heroes, we'll examine the debacle that resulted, the Cleveland Barons. This is Sports Forgotten Heroes, a tribute to the stars who shape the games we love to watch and the games we love to play. Stars who provided us with many thrills, but when their time was up, they faded away. We'll take a look back at their spectacular careers, their moments of fame, even if it was just for one season or just one game. And now, here's your host, Warren Rogan. Hello and welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes, episode number 115, The Cleveland Barons. When coming back from hiatus a few weeks ago, I had some catching up to do and a lot of reading. My first episode back was about the 1920s football legend, Patty Driscoll, and I followed that up with the history of the NHL's Atlanta Thrashers. Last episode was about middleweight boxer Leo Houck, and now I'm back to hockey with another team. Now certainly, the name of my podcast, Sports Forgotten Heroes, does not necessarily encapsulate a forgotten team, but for some, a team can be heroic. For many, teams that no longer exist can be forgotten. While the Atlanta Thrashers might not be completely forgotten, there are so many in Cleveland who have never heard of the Cleveland Barons or thought they were a minor league hockey team from a bygone era. Well, once upon a time, the Barons were a minor league hockey team. And at one time, the NHL wanted the Barons to move up and join the NHL. But incredibly, Barron's ownership turned down the National Hockey League. They were succeeding as a minor league franchise, and they didn't want to risk upsetting the fan base, turning a perennial winner into a potential perennial loser during expansion. Later, in 1967, the NHL did expand, and the California Golden Seals failed in Oakland. The Seals needed to find a new home or fold shop. They searched and settled on Cleveland, and that's where this story takes an incredible turn. The owners of the Seals had never stepped foot in Cleveland. They had no idea where the Richfield Coliseum was located, only that it had 18,000 seats. 
ownership thought that a new NHL team would fill those seats. <laughs> wow, were they wrong. What a miscalculation. Not only would they not fill the seats, hardly anyone showed up, ever, and I mean anyone. Today, very few Clevelanders even know that an NHL team actually called Cleveland home. There were times that the Barons players threatened to walk out. NHL owners in the middle of the season were willing to fold the team. The Cleveland Barons truly never had a shot. Absolute ineptitude in the front office from a gross miscalculation on fan excitement to marketing, to television and radio contracts, everything. And on this episode of Sports Forgotten Heroes, an old friend stops by, Gary Webster, who has been with us before to talk about the All-America Football Conference and the great Speck Sanders. Well, he recently released a book about the Cleveland Barons. The NHL's Mistake by the Lake, a history of the Cleveland Barons. Gary joins us to talk about the Barons, how they came to be, their amazing existence, and their incredible departure. It is truly a fascinating story. Oh, and I'd like to thank the folks at McFarland and Company for sending me a copy of the book, which of course is a must read for any hockey fan. Before we start today's episode, I want to remind everyone to follow Sports Forgotten Heroes on Twitter at Sports F Heroes. Look for the Sports Forgotten Heroes page on Facebook and to check out my website, sportsfh.com. That's sportsfh.com. There you can find out more information about my guests, how to order their books and other merchandise. Find out more about the stars and teams I talk about, and much, much more. Also, please send me an email to let me know how I'm doing, or a question for a future episode, or suggest a future topic. Several people have done so already, and I have had several shows based on topics that people have written me about. So send that email to sportsfh.info at gmail.com. That's sportsfh.info at gmail.com. And as always, thanks for your support. Hey, also a reminder to everyone, can't forget this, Sports Forgotten Heroes is a proud member of the Sports History Network. Okay, let's get into today's show about the Cleveland Barons with my guest, Gary Webster. Gary, welcome back to Sports Forgotten Heroes. I'm thrilled you're with us. I've talked to you a couple times about football, but now hockey. How are you doing? Well, Ward, I'm doing very well, and I'm pleased to be uh, back on the Sports Forgotten Heroes podcast. Uh, this would be more accurately called uh, Sports Forgotten Teams yeah. podcast. Yeah. I would I would not be surprised if there are a lot of people here in Northeastern Ohio who have no idea that the Cleveland Barons of the National Hockey League ever existed. That would not surprise me at all. Well, it's funny you say that in my notes. I have that question for you. But before we actually get there, I think we need to start at the beginning, Gary, much like your book from McFarland and Company. The NHL's Mistake by the Lake. We need to go back to the original Cleveland Barons of the American Hockey League. What can you tell us about that team? How well it played? Whether or not the community supported it, accepted it, where they played and what happened to them. Tell us a little bit about that original team known as the Cleveland Barons. Well, the original Cleveland Barons of the American Hockey League, and I didn't know this myself until I did the research for the book about the Barons of the National Hockey League. One thing that I mentioned 
repeatedly in the book is how the bearings of the National Hockey League never should have existed. And I found out another reason why the barons of the NHL never should have existed. And it was because the barons of the AHL should have joined the NHL. Yes. In the early, in the early 1940s, the Cleveland barons should have joined the NHL. And so the, the debacle of the late 70s should never have happened. The Barons joined the American Hockey League in 1937. They were owned by a man named Al Sutton. They played in the Cleveland Arena, which opened in, uh, I believe it was 1936. It was just on the outskirts of downtown Cleveland. Sat uh, not quite 10,000 spectators. The Barons were immediately the cream of the crop in the American Hockey League. So much so that uh, after the 1941-42 the season, the Barons actually averaged more fans per game than the New York Rangers and the fabled Montreal Canadiens of wow. the National Hockey League. The Barons averaged more fans per game. Wow. So shortly... Shortly after the outbreak of World War II, when, of course, uh, players at all sports were joining the armed forces of their own free will or being drafted into the, uh, into the Army, the National Hockey League at that time had the original six teams plus a team called the New York Americans. Right. They had two teams in New York, the Americans and the Rangers, the Rangers were not, the Americans were not faring very well and ultimately wound up leaving the National Hockey League, which left them with the original six franchises. And the owners of those franchises thought six teams is just not quite enough. We really need to add a couple of teams, but rather than expanding in the um, I guess I could say in the usual way, what they did instead was offer Al Sutphin a chance to move the Barons into the National Hockey League. They also wanted to move the Buffalo Bisons of the uh, AHL into the NHL so they would have an even number of clubs. They would have eight clubs. The Barons and the Bisons were both geographically in the right place. They were close to Montreal, to Toronto, to Detroit, right. to Chicago. Right. They were geographically perfectly positioned. And the National Hockey League owners were absolutely stunned when Al Sutton said, thanks, but no thanks. I'll stay in the American Hockey League. Yeah, I was stunned, too, when I read that in your book. I'm like, really? You get invited to the major leagues and you say no? Well, in a nutshell, Sutton's reasons for staying in the American Hockey League were, there were two basic reasons. First of all, the Barons were the kingpins of the American Hockey League. They led the league in home attendance. They were the league's best draw on the road. And Sutton, rightly or wrongly, there is no way of ever knowing if this was the case or not, Sutton truly believed that if he pulled the Barons out of the American Hockey League, it would collapse. The AHL would fall to pieces without his team. The other reason was he was used to being, in his uh, brief time in the American Hockey League, the big fish in mm -hmm. the small pond. Mm -hmm. And to join the National Hockey League, undoubtedly the Barons would not dominate the NHL as they had dominated the AHL. Sutton liked being the dominant power in the American Hockey League. So essentially, those were the two reasons. And Sutton also felt that if the Barons and the Bisons would leave the American Hockey League, that would ruin the AHL. Of course, neither one of them left, so we don't know if that would have been the case or not. But those are the two reasons why the Barons stayed in the American Hockey League, and that eventually 
came back to bite them in the rear end about 10 years later. Right, when the Cleveland Crusaders came in from the World Hockey Association and the Barons basically got ousted because a quote-unquote Major League Hockey team was coming to play in Cleveland. And the WHA had big plans. They signed NHL stars to big contracts. And the Crusaders lured the great Jerry Cheevers away from the Boston Bruins to play goal. That was a big coup. So tell us now about, yeah. So tell us about how that all worked out, how the Barons had to leave because of the Crusaders. And then again, whether or not the community supported and accepted the Crusaders, how they performed on the ice. And most importantly, where did the Crusaders play? Well, Warren, before we get to that, I just want to mention briefly what I was alluding to was that in, in 1952, when Al Sutton had sold the Barons to a guy named Jim Handy, Jim Handy wanted to put the Barons in the National Hockey League. Oh, stadium. that's right. I did applied skip for that. Admission, yes. Applied for admission, thought he had it, but the vote among the original six teams was three to three. The Barons were not accepted in 1952, and among the uh, the reasons, which was never admitted, but a lot of people who owned NHL teams in 1942 owned NHL teams in 1952, they were still stinging from the rejection <laughs> of 10 exactly. years before. So now it was, hey, 10 years ago, we weren't good enough for you. Well, guess what? Now you're not good enough for us. <laughs> and so... So Cleveland remained in the American Hockey League. They had applied for membership in the 1972 expansion class. And the, the National Hockey League just went crazy with expansion. After having the original six teams for 25 years, they finally gave in to the, the need to expand and add more cities that really did deserve to have National Hockey League teams. They expanded way too fast. They added 12 teams in eight years, which is the height of insanity. But one of those cities was not Cleveland. Nick Moretti, who had purchased the Barons in 1968, applied for membership to the NHL in 1972 and was rejected in favor of Washington, D.C., and Kansas City. Mm -hmm. So, at this time, the World Hockey Association had just been created. It already had 11 teams, but Maletti was determined to bring Major League Hockey to Cleveland. He had brought the NBA in the form of the Cleveland Cavaliers two years earlier, and Maletti was determined to bring Major League Hockey, quote-unquote, to Cleveland the World Hockey Association said it would be major league, and so they added Cleveland as the 12th franchise. The team was christened the Crusaders. It would play originally in the Cleveland Arena, which by that time could pretty much be described as the decrepit old Cleveland Arena. <laughs> it, was, it was crumbling. It was falling apart. But... On the drawing board was the Richfield Coliseum. Right. Now, before, Richfield, before, before we get to the Coliseum, though, before we get there, because it is such a huge part to this story, um, just go back for a moment, if, if, if you would. I have two, two questions here for you, Gary. First off, did the community support the Crusaders that's that's my first question. What kind, you know, and what kind of attendance did the Crusaders get? And then the second question is, who was Nick Maletti? I mean, how in the world did he gain ownership of the Crusaders? I think 
He was an owner of the Indians, now the Guardians, ultimately the Richfield Coliseum, and he was the owner of the Barons of the AHL. So first tell us about the kind of fan support or lack of that the Crusaders experienced, and then tell us a little more or what you can about Nick Maletti. Well, Ward, one time, Cleveland was a hotbed of hockey. As I mentioned, in the early 40s, the Barons averaged 8,267 per game, which was more than the Rangers, more than the Canadiens. In the mid-1940s, when the Barons were winning Calder Cup championships, that's symbolic of the championship of the American Hockey League. Sure. One season in a 9,700-seat arena, they averaged over 10,000 fans per game. So they averaged standing room only for every game. It's incredible. It's incredible. They averaged like 500 more fans than they had seats for every game. By the time the late 1960s rolled around, the support for the Barons was not what it had once been. And part of that was because in the 1940s, the American Hockey League was a minor league, but it was not the feeder system that it is today for the National Hockey League. Uh The The players who belonged to the Cleveland Barons belonged to the Cleveland Barons. They were under contract to the Barons. Now, many of them wound up in the NHL because that was one way for American Hockey League owners to make money, was sell their players who were ready to move up to the NHL, sell them to the highest bidder. But the players belonged to the Barons. They were Cleveland's players, and the fans could get attached to them. By the late 60s, of course, the AHL had become what it is now, a farm system for the NHL. So Cleveland's players, with a few notable exceptions, such as Fred Glover, such as Bill Needham, Cleveland's players belonged to, and I I couldn't tell you uh, which team they were a farm team for. I don't remember who it was. But you become attached to these players, and as soon as they get good, they move up to the NHL. They're not really your players anymore. So support was beginning to wane for the the Barons, but they still were among the stronger franchises in the American Hockey League. Then Nick Maletti came along in 1968, bought the arena and the Barons simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Uh, you Mm -hmm. You and I could do a whole podcast on Nick Maletti and the empire that he built and the empire that crumbled beneath him in a relatively short period of time from like 1972 (laughs) to 76, Maletti scaled Mount Everest and then fell off the peak. Um, the, The final acquisition for Maletti was the Crusaders and uh, the Crusaders started out well enough on the ice considering that they were the last team to be added to the WHA and had to be put together at the 11th hour they had a highly respectable team the first two years they had uh, winning seasons made the playoffs And then the third season, they moved into the Richfield Coliseum, which Maletti built without spending a penny of public money on it. An amazing feat. There were no bond issues. There were no tax issues on the ballot in Northeastern Ohio asking the public to support Maletti's dream by coming up with the money for the Coliseum. Not one penny of public money was spent on the Coliseum. Wow. So, um, so to put it chronologically, first came the Barons and the arena. Next came the expansion Cavaliers. Next came the Crusaders. Last, and absolutely not least, Maletti bought the oldest 
most established sports franchise in Cleveland. He bought the Indians. He bought the Indians at a time when the owner, Vernon Stouffer, had reached an agreement with a group from New Orleans, which was in the process of building the Superdome. Wow. And they figured, we need more than just to have the Saints play seven games here a year or with exhibitions, maybe eight or nine. Because at that, at that point, that was still in the early 70s when NFL teams played exhibitions all over the place. They didn't necessarily play in their home stadium. They played all over mm-hmm. the place. Mm-hmm. So we're building this Taj Mahal here, and it's only for seven Saints home games. We need more events than that. We need a baseball team, but the folks in New Orleans were realistic enough to, to realize we don't think their league baseball is going to expand to New Orleans. We are just not fertile territory for an expansion team. So let's see if we can do what, uh, curiously enough, on the day that we're recording this podcast, um, oh. I just visited the ESPN website a couple of hours ago the and made the league Expos. baseball. Yeah, Toronto and uh, Tampa Bay will not split the Tampa Bay Rays. So I guess. You mean Montreal? Montreal. 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 Yeah. Right. Montreal. Montreal will not get some Tampa Bay Rays games. So I guess the split city concept is still an idea whose time has not come. But in, in 1972, Vernon Stouffer was looking for a life preserver to help him keep control of the Indians. And that was the life preserver. How about if we accept this offer from the Superdome to play, the estimates range from 27 to 33 Indians games would be transferred to New Orleans. You'd play the opener in Cleveland. Then the rest of the games in April and May, when nobody comes to the games here because it's just too cold to be playing (laughs) baseball. We'll have all of the home games in uh, April and May transferred to New Orleans. Then, starting in June, the Indians will play all of their home games in Cleveland. Well, everybody but Vernon Stouffer was convinced this was just going to lead, ultimately, to the Indians moving to New Orleans full-time. So, Maletti put together uh, a group that made Vernon Stouffer an offer. Prior to Maletti's offer, a guy by the name of George M. Steinbrenner III (laughs) had made an offer for the Indians with a a group, and Stouffer had turned it down. Maletti came along with what seemed like a better offer. But to use. Hindsight is 2020. It's, It's always 2020. Maletti offered, theoretically, $9.5 million for the Indians. Steinbrenner's group had offered $8.6 million for the Indians. But to use the, the phrase used by Gabe Paul, uh, a name known here in Cleveland extremely well, sure. after all, the, the man who ran the Indians for, for so many years, Gabe Paul said that Maletti's offer was basically green stamps and promises. And although Maletti insisted when he bought the team, the Cleveland Indians are now the best financed team in baseball. In truth, they were, if not the worst financed team, they were in the bottom five. <laughs> and and within, within three years, Maletti toppled from the Indians' managing general partner to just one of many minority stockholders. The Crusaders, on the other hand, uh, did not fare well at the Coliseum. They didn't even come close to averaging the number of fans that they needed to break even. The Crusaders uh, nearly collapsed in the 1975-76 season. Maletti sold majority ownership to a guy by the name of Jane Moore who also was underfinanced and didn't have the money to run the team properly. So uh, the Crusaders, after the 1975-76 season, wound up in kind of a tug of war 
between Minneapolis and Hollywood, Florida. Right. They were not going to stay in Cleveland. He could not stay in Cleveland. Moore just didn't have the money to run the team. A guy by the name of Bill Putnam came along and made an effort to move the team to Hollywood, Florida, in a building that was to be called the Sportatorium. And that didn't work out either. Bill Putnam didn't have the money to buy the Crusaders. Maletti wound up taking over the franchise and moved it to St. Paul to become the second incarnation of the Minnesota Fighting Saints. And the Minnesota Fighting Saints Part 2 um, wound up being disbanded in uh, late January of 1977. They struggled through four months of the 1976-77 season and disbanded, and that was just a part of Maletti's sports empire crumbling beneath his feet. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk about part of the, the one of the other parts of the sports empire, which you've referred to a couple times already, the Richfield Coliseum. It was a big beautiful building uh over 18,000 could sit in there for a hockey game it had everything you would want as far as modern is concerned in fact I remember going there in 1984 to see the U.S. Olympic hockey team play an exhibition game there um also mm -hmm. saw many Cleveland Cavaliers games there um but as big and as modern as it was, it had one flaw that you just couldn't overcome or it couldn't overcome. Location. Talk about where the Richfield Coliseum was located and how its location affected the potential for success. The Richfield Coliseum, Warren, uh, the, the writers here in Cleveland, even though it was a fantastic facility and everybody agreed about that, there could be no arguing that point. The writers here in Cleveland used to call it, in uh, reference to a, a popular TV show of the time, the Big House on the Prairie. <laughs> and the reason was that is exactly where it was. It was on the prairie. Now, you having been there, uh, you know where it was. I right. was there a number of times. Um, I was there the night the Cavaliers beat the Washington Bullets, then the Washington Bullets, in the seventh game of the Eastern Conference semifinals during what we call the Miracle of Richfield uh -huh. season, 75-76. The problem with the Coliseum was there were only there was only one access road. It was built at the um, intersection of Interstate 271 going north and south and Ohio Route 303 going east and west. The only way to get into the Coliseum was off of Route 303, so you had people coming from all four directions, and the, the lines waiting to get off of I-271 could be a mile and more long in both directions. The line from east and west on Route 303 trying to get into the parking lot could be a mile and more long. That was the problem. It was also a problem of getting out. I was at the Coliseum on a few occasions when it was sold out. And what I would do is simply wait until the building emptied out. Then I would go out to my car, and if the traffic was still ridiculous, I'd just turn on the engine, listen to the, the post-game show, and sit there maybe for 45 minutes or an hour or more. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. It might be an hour or more <laughs> before the parking lot was pretty much empty, and then I could leave. I mean, otherwise, you were going to be fighting for, for letting, to get people to let you into the line, trying to get out. 
and there is one one other thing, and I'm thinking about it as I'm talking to you because I'm looking out the the window of my bedroom and the snow is falling, and literally, it could be dangerous <laughs> to go to the Coliseum during basketball or hockey season. It was in the midst of nowhere, and when the snow was falling and the wind was blowing, 271 would be very quick to become snow-covered and icy, and it could be literally dangerous to go to the Coliseum many times when the Cavaliers or the Barons would play. However, eventually the Cavaliers started winning, and people would take that risk. The Barons never won, and nobody was going to risk life and limb to go down to the Coliseum and watch them lose another game. That was the problem with the Coliseum. Access and egress was very difficult if you had any kind of a crowd. The Barons never had to worry about that because they were putting four and 5,000 people in there, so it was pretty easy to get in and pretty <laughs> easy to get out. But when there were people in that building, it took you forever to get in, it took you forever to get out, and if it was a night like we're having tonight in northeastern Ohio, it could literally be dangerous to drive to the Coliseum. Wow. All right. I think we've done a really good job at setting the table for what's about to happen. Now, there are four teams that really play a prominent role in the story of the Cleveland Barons and the Cle of the NHL, not the AHL. Although the AHL Barons obviously did play a role as well. So we've, we've laid the groundwork with the AHL Cleveland Barons. We've discussed the Cleveland Crusaders. There are two other teams that I think play a pretty prominent role one for sure, in the story of the Cleveland Barons, one of whom is the Kansas City Scouts, and you mentioned them. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us uh, how the Scouts' story sort of relates and plays a role in the Barons' story. Well, late in the 1975-76 season, Jay Moore, at this point, owns the Barons, uh, owns the uh, Crusaders, excuse me, owns the Crusaders, is losing gobs of money and has decided the only way to save Major League Hockey in Cleveland is for me to get rid of the Crusaders. And there are two NHL teams that are in really bad shape, the California Golden Seals and the Kansas City Scouts. And Moore decides, I'm going to buy the Scouts and move them to Cleveland. And even though I have researched this book, I have no clue how Moore thought he was going to come up. He didn't have the money to run the Crusaders. Where was this guy <laughs> going to come up with the money to buy the Kansas City Scouts? I have no idea, and my research, or my research did not indicate where this money might come from, but Moore decided I can buy the Kansas City Scouts. I'll move them to Cleveland. Then we'll have real big-time hockey here, even though the Scouts were a horrible team. Horrible. Uh, asking for and, and by the way, I'm sorry to interrupt. If anybody wants to hear the story about the Kansas City Scouts, episode number 52 of Sports Forgotten Heroes. I did quite the uh, extensive story of the Scouts um, with a guy by the name of Troy Treasure who wrote a book about the Scouts called Icing on the Plains, The Rough Ride of Kansas City's NHL Scouts. Terrific story, just like the Barons. Now, continue. <laughs> So the price tag on the scouts was reported to be $3 million. However, anybody buying the scouts would have been expected to assume the club's debt, which was reported to be $5 million. So 
you were looking at a price tag of $8 million. The NHL was determined to get that team out of Kansas City or, if necessary, liquidate it. But there would be no Kansas City scouts in 1976-77. The question was, would the team be purchased and moved? Would it be liquidated? But the NHL wanted no part of Kansas City. Mm -hmm. Well, Jay Moore was never going to be able to come up with the financing to buy the scouts. Eventually, he realized that, but suddenly it came to his attention that the Golden Seals were also for sale. And for some reason, and I don't know what this reason is, but for some reason, Moore decided, I don't want the scouts anymore. I want the Golden Seals. I'm going to find a way to bring them to Cleveland. Mm -hmm. And uh, the scouts originally wound up becoming the Colorado Rockies, who eventually wound up becoming the New Jersey Devils. Right. And the team that plays there now, the Avalanche, actually were one of the four WHA teams absorbed by the NHL. They were the uh, Quebec Nordiques. Mm -hmm. So now the California Golden Seals. Now, the Seals were one of the NHL's first expansion teams in 67-68, and despite nine years of trying with only two playoff appearances, they just really never caught on in the Oakland, San Francisco, San Jose area. By the time the 75-76 season got underway, everyone knew the Seals needed to move or fold. Cleveland at that point wanted a team and midway through the summer of 76, and I know I'm skipping a lot here, everything fell into place and the Seals were on their way to Cleveland. And like you said before, considering Cleveland's proximity to Buffalo, to Detroit, to Chicago, to Toronto, it seemed like a no-brainer, but the short ramp-up to the season and the location of the Coliseum, amongst other things, <laughs> sure didn't help the Barons get off on the right foot. So talk about the Seals moving to Cleveland, the baggage they brought with them, the incredibly slow start to marketing the team, the Coliseum. From the outset, I mean, Gary, this didn't look like a good idea. Not not in any way, shape, or form. Not as quickly as it happened. There was no time to get ready. Well, no, there wasn't. And, and Warren, um, as, a, as a Sabre member, you can possibly uh, confirm this for me. I think that the only franchise transfer that ever happened with the kind of rapidity of the Golden Seals to Cleveland would have been the transfer of the Boston Braves to Milwaukee, which happened like midway through spring training. Lou Perini said, I'm moving the team. Yeah, and, and the one other one was, was the Seattle Pilots. They played oh, yeah, one right. season, 1969. The Pilots played in 1969. And when they went to spring training, they were still the Seattle Pilots. When spring training ended, they started to head north from Arizona. And along the way, basically, the story is somehow they contacted the, uh, the, 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 the drivers moving the equipment back to Seattle. And um, they were told to make a right turn and head to Milwaukee. So the pilots were done, and hello, Milwaukee, once again, the Brewers. So they started the season. They started spring training as the Seattle Pilots, and when the season started, they were the Milwaukee Brewers. So it happened in Milwaukee twice. They got the Braves on, like, two weeks' notice, and they got the pilots on, like, two days' notice. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> they had an incredible thing. Now, 
in, in the case of um, the Golden Seals, Mel Swig, the co-owner, the Golden Seals had uh, three owners, although a gentleman named Bud Levitas owned exactly 2% of the Golden Seals and was really never a factor in the story of the Seals becoming the Barons. But Mel Swig owned 60% of the Golden Seals, and George Gunn III, a native Clevelander who was by then living in San Francisco, owned 38%. They had both come to the conclusion as the 1975-76 season was coming to an end that the Golden Seals had to leave Oakland. They were in a small, cramped facility that was uh, not of NHL uh, quality and standards. But their original idea was they were going to move to Denver. Uh, a guy by the name of uh, Bud Palmer, who was a sportscaster in Denver, tried to get the Golden Seals to move to McNichols Arena in Denver. This was going on in uh, the late spring, in May and into June, but a lease agreement could not be worked out, largely because McNichols Arena was publicly owned. You had in Cleveland the Coliseum, which was privately owned, which made reaching a lease agreement a lot easier. There were hoops you did not have to jump through in a privately owned building that you did have to jump through in a municipally owned building. So when it became apparent that there could be no lease agreement reached with McNichols Arena, now Swig and uh, Gund are looking at each other and saying, well, where are we going to go? The only place left is Cleveland. And now we're talking almost the middle of June. And Swig had wanted to have his team in a new city by July 1st. Wow. All the research that I did indicated that Swig moved his team to Cleveland basically on the recommendation of his partner, George Gund III, who grew up in Cleveland, whose family is still a pillar of the Cleveland community to this day. But it was little more than Gund's recommendation. Oh, I used to watch the Barons growing up when I was a kid and I went to the games, and the, the games were sold out, and the, the Barons were very popular. And they got this great building there, and it would be the biggest in the NHL, 18,544 seats. No NHL building is that big. The NHL really did want to have a team in that building. But there was essentially no homework done. What we would refer to today is due diligence. None of that was done. Yeah, Swig never no, even. Swig, Swig, the story is that Swig has never, ever, ever stepped foot in Cleveland in his entire no, life never even until there. until some point after the team moved there. Well, he his first visit to Cleveland was June twenty third, and the reason he came to Cleveland was to get a guided tour of the Coliseum. That was the first time Mel Swig had ever set foot in Cleveland. Here is the owner of a major league sports franchise, a multi-million dollar business, and he's going to move it to a city that he's never seen, a city that he knows nothing, nothing more about than George Gunn III saying, I grew up watching the Barons. People love the Barons. They'll, they'll love the Golden Seals. Let's take them there. And they reached a lease agreement within like 24 hours and put the question before the NHL Board of Governors. The Board of Governors really wanted to have a team in this beautiful building. And the approval was almost rubber stamped, almost automatic, but there was one minor problem, which was really not such a minor problem problem, and that was they were expecting, the Board of Governors was expecting Swig to get some local investors. Of course, I mean, technically he had a local right, investor, Gund. Gund the third, who still had an apartment in Cleveland. It was not his full-time residence anymore, but as I also mentioned, his family is still a pillar of the community here in the year 2022. So, 
I guess he could be considered a local investor. But when the question was posed to Swig, his answer was, um, that's George's department. Well, what's what's he doing to, to get some local investors? I don't know. Ask him. <laughs> that was Mel's big answer. That's George's department. I don't know what he's doing. If you want to know what he's up to, ask him. Wow. And and the transfer was approved. It took until uh, the, the middle of July for the remaining question marks to be removed from the equation. And I believe it was uh, July 14th, 1976, roughly 30 days after Swig realized, I can't move the team to Denver. That leaves me only with Cleveland. 30 days later, he moves the team to Cleveland, knowing nothing about the city. He doesn't talk to any political officials. He doesn't talk to the mayor of Cleveland. He doesn't talk to the governor of Ohio. He doesn't speak to um, anybody in a position of authority in Summit County, which is where the Coliseum is located. He speaks to no one. He just brings the team to Cleveland. And uh, on on one of the pages of the book, I, I say that Basically, the word hope <laughs> comes up over in the book. Swig hoped that everything would fall into place once he got here. He hoped the fans would come to the Coliseum. He hoped he would get local investors. There was a whole lot of hope going on with no basis for that hope. And that's how the Golden Fields wound up in Cleveland, uh, two and a half months before the 1976-77 season started, no homework was done whatsoever, and the price was paid by everybody involved. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, Cleveland's got a hockey team at this point. So let's take our, our let's turn our attention to the game on the ice. They got a hockey team, an NHL franchise, the Barons. And they had a few good players, namely the goalie, Gilles Maloche, Dennis Marouk, a center who had a lethal shot and a knack for scoring goals, Um, especially as he got older. uh, He's one of the first to ever get 60 in a season. I did a a podcast with him uh, way back when. Al McAdam was on the team. Jim Nielsen. Gary, no one showed up for the games. Attendance was basically non-existence. And there were a lot of excuses. One of which was the team didn't have enough Friday or Saturday night games. Uh, But the Cavs had midweek games and they put a lot more fannies in the seat. So to say... It's only because you didn't have enough Friday and Saturday night, Saturday night games. That's why we didn't attract fans. Why didn't the fans turn out? And could Cleveland be considered a hockey town? Well, Warren, I, I think Cleveland can be considered a hockey town now because, as I noted, In the opening chapter of the book, we have an American Hockey League team now, the Cleveland Monsters, who in 2015-2016 won the Calder Cup, and the clinching game was played in front of the second largest crowd in the American Hockey League history, just a few fans shy of 20,000 fans. Incredible. Wow. Incredible. So... But and how much of that really is due to how much of that is due to do they play in the arena where the Cavs play now? How much of that is due to location as well? Well, yes. I mean, now they play downtown. They play in Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse where the Cavaliers play. They do play downtown, which eliminates a lot of the problems that existed as far as uh, access to the Coliseum was concerned. But Warren, the interesting thing. As I researched this book and wrote this book, is that all the other books 
that I have written, the 1920 Indians, the 54 Indians, the 48 Browns, the All-America Football Conference, and to uh, a certain extent, the book about managerial changes in Major League Baseball, all of these things happened before I was born, before my lifetime. Huh. I was 20, I was 20 years old when the Barons moved here. I was a junior in college when we got the California Golden Seals, who became the Cleveland Barons. So I remember the two years that we had a hockey team. Mm -hmm. And I can honestly tell you, I was one of those people who paid no attention to Hmm. the Barons. Hmm. Interesting. I never listened. I never listened to a Barons game on the radio. I never watched a Barons game on TV. I never went to a Barons game at the Coliseum. And I can't really explain to you why that was, because the Indians, Cavaliers, and Browns were the passion of my life. Well, you wrote, you also wrote something in your book. You wrote that Cleveland fans don't support teams that lose. That's very true and still true to this day. And there's something else in the book. You talked about Dennis Marouk. He was the one guy who obviously did at least a little bit of research into the city of Cleveland and its sports history. Maybe if Mel Swig had taken the time to do the research that Marouk did, he might have thought twice about moving the team to Cleveland, or at least would have had a better perspective on the difficulty that awaited his team when he got here. But Marouk, during the first season, spoke to a meeting of the uh, Blue Liners Club. They actually did have a a support the Barons type club. I don't know how many people belong to it. Mm -hmm. I doubt that they had much of a membership. But Marouk spoke to that group and said, you got to look at the past, and it took the Cavaliers five years to get any kind of um, backing from the fans here. You look at the first year of the Cavaliers at the arena. Warren, it's a miracle the Cavaliers survived until the second season. They averaged 3,500 people a game their first season. Wow. Well, let me well, well, let me ask you this, Gary, because that's basically what the Barons did. So the Barons, you know, their first year, they actually started off decently, six, seven, and six. But after those first nineteen games, it got bad. I mean, really bad, and they struggled really badly, mightily on offense. Certainly, filling the Coliseum would have been great, but I'm not sure that selling out every game also means you're going to win. But like the Cavs, you said they only averaged 3,500 around there their first season. Does playing in front of 3,500 to 5,000 fans, can that affect the psyche of a team? How much of a role did the non-existent crowds, in your opinion, affect the play of the Cleveland Barons? Well, I I think it had to. Now, my athletic experience consisted of trying out for the JV baseball team in 10th grade (laughs) and, and being named the equipment manager. I wound up as the equipment manager because the first game of the season, I showed up to cheer for my teammates and none of the other guys who didn't make the team showed up to cheer for their teammates. So one of the coaches saw me sitting in the stands, told me, put on a helmet, stand beside me and shag the balls as the outfielders throw them in during batting practice. And after the game, I was offered the job as equipment manager. So I can't speak from the experience of having been an athlete who played in front of small crowds. However, I have done a lot of work in the community theater. I know what it feels like to walk out on stage in a theater that seats maybe 300 people and you see 10 people sitting there. You, you try not to let it affect you, but you wouldn't be human if it didn't. Plus the fact that 
the barons, the, the Golden Seals, rather, were all told when they were uprooted from Oakland and told, hey, we're moving you 2,500 miles to Cleveland. You got to sell your houses and uproot your families and so on and so on. So there is some trauma involved there. But when you get to Cleveland, you're going to play in this great building and you're going to have huge, loud crowds at every game. That's what they were told. So they're expecting Cleveland to be the land of milk and honey, and it's not. And I don't think that you can look into the stands and see 3,000 people, 4,000 people, and 14 or 15,000 empty seats and not be affected by it. Mm-hmm. I, I just mm-hmm. doubt very much that that is possible. So. I, I think it, you look at some of the games, the, the handful of games where they drew decent crowds. I mean, the first 10,000 plus crowd they had was against Philadelphia, who had been uh, two time Stanley Cup champions, and the Barons won. Right. They had 10,000 people screaming for them, and they won. Um, I think it had to make a difference. On their site, they tried to insist that it didn't. Well, I shouldn't say that because I have a lot of quotes from the players in the book saying, geez, where is everybody? Yeah. We'd like to have more fans. We really would love to have more fans. You had to, you had to ask yourself, why don't these people like us? Yeah. <laughs> why aren't they coming out to see us? What, well, what well, did we do? Well, part of it was the marketing, and they went to a Radio station with a weak signal, no television. I mean, boy, what a mess. And, I mean, everything. And and we're only in the first season. And Mm -hmm. we're talking now January, going into February. And, Gary, we could probably do an entire episode on this mess payroll players yeah. hadn't been paid their moving expenses from Oakland to Cleveland. The NHL was basically helping to support the team, the other owners, and they weren't thrilled with pouring money into a team like the Barons. And in fact, some owners thought the best thing that could happen for this team in its first season in Cleveland was to fold right then and there on the spot. And the NHL would conduct a uh, dispersal draft or declare all the players free agents. The players didn't want to play anymore. The coach, Jack Evans, I have no idea how he held it together. He, He even said, and you said this in your book, he wasn't even coaching to win at this point. He was letting players show off their talents. So... If there was to be a dispersal draft, other teams uh, uh, would have had the opportunity to see these players play, all the players, so they could, you know, make a judgment as to whether or not they wanted them in case they did become free agents or there was a dispersal draft. Ownership was arguing with each other. The players didn't respect Mel Swig anymore because they felt he was rich enough that he could be paying them from his own bank account. The players, they were going to go on strike. At one point, everyone actually thought the team had folded. I don't even know where to start. What happened? (laughs) Can you take us a little bit through this mess? I mean, how in the world did this happen, and, and how was it solved so the Barons could finish the season, their first season? Well, um, let me just say this, and I'm, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but of all the books that I have written, I think the chapter that is entitled, Buddy, Can You Spare a Payroll? I think that might be the best work I have ever done because of how convoluted this situation was and to try to sort it out and keep it organized in a chronological manner but well, let me just line, say this. Let me say this, Gary. I knocked your book off real quickly. 
I'm obviously very interested in in these topics, but it is the research is there. It's a fun book to read. It's uh, very eye opening that some of this could happen in professional sports. I had a great time reading your book. Terrific book, uh, McFarland and Company. And I suggest anybody out there, especially a hockey fan, you got to get this. It's a great book, Gary. Kudos to you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Now, to try to keep a long story not too long, the month of, uh, from the middle of January till late in February, at the All Star break, at the All Star break, the National Hockey League Board of Governors convened. Mel Swig was there, and he wasn't the only owner with his hat in his hand. The Atlanta Flames were on the verge of, uh, of bankruptcy. The Pittsburgh Penguins were on the verge of bankruptcy. Mel Swig went to the Board of Governors and said, I'm losing my shirt here. Nobody's coming to the games. The move is not working out. And I am tired of dipping into my own pocket to meet the club's expenses. You're going to have to help me. I want help from the NHL. Or I'm just going to have to fold up my tent. And as you mentioned, some owners would have been more than happy for that to happen. So for about five weeks, the owners argued, the players argued with the owners, the owners argued among themselves, the players um, argued among themselves. The problem here was that some of the players knew if the Barons fold, I'm going to be out of work. It was a hard admission to have to make. Some players like Marouk, like Malash, like McAdam, they knew that if there was a dispersal draft or if they got their way, the players insisted, if the team folds, we are free agents. And the owner said, that's what you think. <laughs> and if it had ever come to that, that would have become a very interesting story. If it had come to that, if the Barons had folded, what would have happened? Because the NHL Players Association said they are free agents. And the owner said, oh, no, they aren't. We will have a draft. They'll go where they're told. That would have been a fascinating story in and of itself. But it had to be a hard admission for some of these Barons to make that, hey, if the team folds, nobody's going to pick me up. I'm out of work. And so the players argued among themselves, what are we going to do with this offer and that offer? What became so incredibly frustrating to the players was there was, there were, I don't know how many rumors that, okay, we've come to an agreement. The Barons are saved. Oops, that one fell through. Let's start again. Ah, we've reached an agreement now. The Barons are saved. Oops. Somebody pulled out. Well, back to the drawing board. Now the Barons are saved. Oops, that one didn't work out either. And the players are getting sick and tired of it. By the 22nd of February, they decided we've got to draw the line in the sand. If we, they already, they did not get their paychecks for January 30th until February 15th. And February 15th also happened to be payday. And they didn't get paid on the 15th as they were supposed to for the first right. two weeks of February. What they got paid on the 15th for was the last two weeks of January. So um, let me let me try to get to back on track here because there are so many tangents that I can get off on. Right. So so so, but you're saying they got money, they got paid, but how? Where did the money come from? Did the other owners finally decide? Well, we're going to support the team. Um, we'll figure out a way to make help you make payroll, Mel. How, what, what happened? Well, what I, I wanted to get back to for just a moment was that all of the research I did indicated Mel Swig had the money to pay the players. He had the money to meet the January 30th payroll. But he had drawn a line in the sand himself. 
He said, look, I have already put one and a half million dollars of my own money into this team. This has got to stop. And I'm going to make it stop. I'm not going to pay the players. I'm going to tell the league I need help from them or else. And then we'll see what the Board of Governors decide. So the players, having read this, are all bent out of shape because they know. The owner has said, I've got the money to pay them. I've got the money to pay them. But I'm not going to. So, you know, how do you feel? If you're in that position, your boss says, I've got the money to meet your payroll, but I'm not right. going to do it. Right. So the league, the league allowed Swig to meet his January 30th payroll on February 15th. The league emptied up $175,000. But that led to the great purge because $175,000 was not enough for Swig to pay all the players on his team and then the minor leaguers that the Barons controlled uh, at their Salt Lake City Farm Club and their Toledo Farm Club. So the players were paid, and then promptly the next payroll that was due the same day that they got their January 30th pay, they were supposed to be paid for the first two months of February, and they weren't. And the players said, on the 22nd of February, either we get paid or we are declaring ourselves free agents. Well, the deadline of February 22nd came and went. And again, you're hearing the Barons are saved. Oh, no, they're not. The Barons are saved. No, they're not. It looked like the only <laughs> guy who could save the Barons was Lord Gunn III, who spent most of this time on vacation in South America and pretty much not really caring what was going on back home. So on the 23rd of February, the Barons had a game scheduled with um, Buffalo, and the players made it clear, unless we get a resolution to this situation and we get it today, we're not playing the game tonight, and we're going to declare ourselves free agents. The surprising thing then becomes the man who wound up keeping the team going for the rest of the season. And it was not George Gund III. It was the president of the National Hockey League Players Association, a guy named Alan Eagleson. Sure. Who, uh, I guess... Uh, I don't follow hockey nearly as closely as I used to, so I really don't know all the details and particulars, but I guess he is now the disgraced Alan Eagleson, who was the only person ever to be kicked out of a Hall of Fame. Yeah, that's a whole story in and of itself. A whole story in itself. But Eagleson throughout this process had been the voice of reason. Eagleson had insisted it is – better for all concerned that the Barons finish out the season. And he said that out of concern for the players that he knew would be out of work if the Barons folded. Eagleson counseled the players, think of your teammates. I know you're all angry and frustrated, and I can't order you to accept less money than your contract called for but it is in everybody's best interest to think of the bigger picture, keep the team going till the end of the season, think of your teammates who are going to wind up out of jobs if the Barons fold. So ultimately, Mel Swig put up $350,000, and uh, National Hockey League put up $350,000, and Eagleson, on behalf of the National Hockey League Players Association, borrowed $600,000 with the stipulation that money was to be spent only for player salaries. And with that $1.3 million, the Barons had the money to finish out the 1976-77 season. So Alan Eagleson was the man who wound up saving, quote-unquote, the Barons. Right, and, and just if anybody's interested... 
Eagleson was charged with racketeering, uh, embezzlement, uh, you know, just a whole bunch of different crimes, um, stealing money from the players. So, you know, all sorts of different stuff. So, you know, you could do the research on that. So, in short, the Barons are saved for the time being. No one at this point knows whether or not the Barons will actually return for a second season in Cleveland, but they're going to make it through this first year. The players got their pay, as you said. Strangely, though, after all this went down, at least for a little bit, the fans started to show up. 10,000 fans a game during the final stretch of the season. Why? What happened? Well, I'm not completely sure myself why that happened. Of course, it makes you scratch your head. I mean, here is a team that is totally out of playoff contention. They have no shot at making the playoffs. Nobody has come out to see them for the first 80% of the season. Then after the trauma of the missed paydays and the threats to move the team and fold the team, they go out on a road trip come back, and they have eight games remaining at the Coliseum, all but one of them through crowds of 10,000 or better. So what is going on here? I want to know. I believe the answer comes from, from two people, one of them being Clarence Campbell, who was uh, leaving his post as the president of the National Hockey League in June of 1977, and the other comes from uh, Bob Schlesinger, who was the hockey beat writer for the Cleveland Press. Even while this was happening, even while the Barons were putting 10 and 11,000 people in the seats for their final home games of the year, Schlesinger said, don't get too excited about this. A lot of these are freebies. (laughs) <laughs> and after the season, after the season, Clarence Campbell said the same thing. As for the sudden burst in attendance, I don't take that seriously because I have been told that, and this is this is the direct quote, a lot of that was paper. Right. So apparently, apparently the Barons papered the house over the last eight games. I said, just try to get people in the arena, and hopefully they'll like what they see. And maybe they'll get excited and come back next year, if there is a next year. And, and Warren, truthfully, papering the house is the only explanation that makes any sense. Because sure. as we talked about briefly earlier, Cleveland does not support a loser. The Barons were a big loser and for suddenly people to come out of the woodwork and go to the last eight home games with the team having no place to go but but home after the season, that makes no sense. So mm-hmm. it had to have been the Barons paper of the house. Mm-hmm. How taxing was this on the players? How were they able to keep it together? You wrote in your book about a player by the name of Len Frigg, and he finally lost it on the ice. Talk about the players and the effect that this had on them? Well, you can imagine the effect that it must have had on them. First of all, they, they get uprooted from Oakland to Cleveland. I don't know how many of the players actually live in the Oakland area. Maybe, maybe not very many, but still your place of business is uprooted and moved 2,500 miles. Your promise when you get to this new city that you're going to have big crowds and a beautiful building, well, you're in a beautiful building. That much was legit. The big crowds, that didn't happen. So you're wondering why is this community not supporting us? Why are they, why are they rejecting us? Then you go through the trauma of the missed paychecks and uh, knowing the team is in financial trouble It was, many of the players were quoted in the book, 
Like this has been going on for years. This did not just happen when we got to Cleveland. For years in Oakland, we were hearing that the franchise is going to be moved. The franchise is going to be liquidated. Now we get to Cleveland where everything is supposed to be okay. And instead it gets worse. So it had to be extremely hard on the players. You mentioned Len Frigg, who literally had a meltdown on the ice during this whole uh, Megillah. Afterward, when it was all over, Hal McAdam was asked for a comment. And I know he was speaking for himself, but he may have been speaking for a number of his teammates as well. And McAdam said, I'm not happy at all. I wanted this team to fold. Right. I want out of Cleveland. I wanted this team to fold so I could wind up somewhere else. McAdam went so far as to say, you know, I may just quit. I may just not even play these last eight games. I may quit. He didn't. But you got to believe that had to be the attitude of a lot of these players. They didn't want the Barons to survive. They, the, the players that knew, the, a Malash, a Marut, a McAdam, who knew if the Barons folded, somebody was going to pick them up. Right. Somebody right. With, with money, somebody that might be on the way to the playoffs. So I'm sure McAdam wasn't the only one who was really not pleased that the team survived. They wanted that team to fold. And they didn't fold. And they met their payroll. And they're coming back for a year two. Take us through that obstacle course of a summer between year one and year two. And how the Barons were saved for a second season. At this point, basically, Mel Swig is out. Sandy Greenberg, I think his name is, the new owner of the Coliseum, came up with this idea of how to involve many locals and get them all to contribute to keep the team in Cleveland. But in the end, it was the Gunn brothers who pulled through to keep the team in Cleveland. They made a three-year commitment they were willing to fund the payroll to a certain extent, and the Barons would live to see another day. Can you take us through that summer? Well, the conventional wisdom in Cleveland was that if the Barons were going to be saved, George Gunn III and quite possibly his brother Gordon would have to do it. Then... Sandy Greenberg, as you mentioned, came up because he is the owner of the Coliseum. He doesn't want 40 nights in 1977-78 when there's nothing going on in the Coliseum. Greenberg was a mover and a shaker and a very aggressive guy who, when he took over a majority ownership of the Coliseum, he owned 90% of the Coliseum, his goal was... I want to have an event in this building every day, 365 days a year. And once I achieve that, I'm going to start doubling up. I want to have events in the afternoon and the evening. Huh. That's the kind of guy Sandy okay. Greenberg was. All right, okay. So he is trying to put together a group to buy the team. And he comes up with an extremely convoluted plan which I believe uh, originally involved trying to recruit as many as 45 part owners who would put up X amount of money. That was the original plan. I've got the book here, but I'm not going to bore everybody with all the details, but I believe it was 45 part owners putting up X amount of money to own whatever it might be, 5% of the Barons, whatever the percentage may be. Well, that would have been a prescription for disaster because we knew that well enough here in Cleveland. We were already going through that with the Indians because the Maletti ownership did not have the money to own the team. And every time the team lost money at the end of the season, 
what did they do? They went out and recruited more minority owners. How would you like to own a, a part of a major league baseball team? Give us fifty thousand dollars, and you'll own a piece of the Indians. That's how they met the uh, losses at the end of each season. Go out there and get new owners. At one point, the Indians had something like fifty limited partners, and that is a prescription for disaster. Talk about you know too many Indians, too many. Um, Cook spoiling the broth, you just you can't have that. <laughs> so Greenberg's plan was destined to fail. Then, then came a much simpler plan. He was going to sell 10, I believe the term was units, 10 units in the Cavaliers. One of them was to be purchased by George Gund III. You mean you mean ten units the of of the Barons? You mean ten ten units? Ten units of the, the Barons. Right. Yes. Ten units of the Barons, one of them to be purchased by George Gund the Third. And supposedly they had commitments from nine other people to buy one unit each, and those ten units would produce a certain amount of money that would be enough to run the Barons for the next several years, even potentially have a loss. And on some day in uh, early June of 1977, the names of these nine people were going to be made public. On the day that announcement was to be made, the gentleman who was putting together this plan for Greenberg said, um, well, I regret to have to make this announcement that those nine people who committed to buy units, they've all changed their minds. They've all backed out. Wow. But okay. do we do we know if that's the truth? Do we know if he actually had those nine people? I don't know if that was, was true or not. It was all very secretive. Um, supposedly, these nine people were not well-known public figures, but they did have money, but they kept to themselves and were not um, in the public eye. So I don't know if that was actually true or not. But given the way the Barons existed for two years, I wouldn't be at all surprised if nine people said, yeah, sure, I'll invest. Uh, on second thought, no, never mind. So it ultimately boiled down to the Gunn brothers were going to have to save the Cavaliers, but they saved the Barons if they were to be saved. And they decided, okay, we got to do this for our hometown. And George Gund III and Brother Gordon Gund bought the Barons in late June of 1977. Swig was out, and the Gund brothers were in. Okay. So we're going to have another hockey season. A year or two, the Barons actually put together a few good runs that year. They actually beat the Canadians in a stunner at home. And for a while, seemed like they might actually contend for a playoff spot. And in order to improve the team, they wanted to make a couple of trades. Now, I don't know. Do I understand this correctly? There's this weird clause in the contract that the Guns had signed when they purchased the team from Swig, that no player could be traded without Swig's approval. And again, he's no longer a part of the team. So that had to be rewritten. Is that correct? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't without Swig's approval because he was gone. He had been paid off. He was out of the picture entirely. But the agreement was, and I can't understand this, I can't understand why the Gunn brothers would ever have agreed to this. There must have been a reason, but I don't know what it was. The agreement was that any move the barons would make, either personnel-wise or to spend money, had to be approved by the president of the Coliseum. Oh, so it was it was uh, Greenberg that had to approve it. Well, Greenberg was the owner. 
the president of the Coliseum was a guy named Stu Giller. <laughs> I had no idea what Stu Giller knew about hockey. Oh, my I have gosh. No idea. But for the early part of the 1977-78 season, if uh, Harry Howell, the general manager, wanted to make a trade, he had to get the approval of Stu Giller, a guy who probably didn't know uh, a hockey puck from an apple pie. Wow. Wow. If the Gun Brothers wanted to spend money on their team for any reason, whatever it might be, they, they are the owners of this team. They had to go to Stu Giller to get his permission. Well, they got that clause rewritten. The Barons actually did go out and make a few trades. They actually played in front of a few 10,000-plus fans a couple of times. But for the most part, again, the Barons just did not catch on. And then, as the season progressed... And January turned to February, and February turned to March. The roof caved in, and the Barons went on this incredible, elongated, winless streak, eliminating them from the playoffs. Gary, it was a disaster on the ice. What happened? Well, after that clause was removed from the sale agreement and the Harry Howell had the authority to make trades without asking for anybody's permission. He did swing uh, a couple of deals that looked like they just might provide the Barons with what they needed. Essentially, it was determined that their problem with the Barons was, of course, for the two years they were here, their biggest problem was they couldn't score goals. The Barons just, aside from Dennis Marouk, they had no offense. They could not score goals. Right. And they were an extremely young team. So what Howell decided he needed to do and wanted to add some toughness as well. The Barons were a finesse team, and they needed to add some uh, some toughness in a tough sport. So Howell made a couple of trades to get two enforcers to add some veteran leadership to the team and to add some offense to the team. And after these trades were made, there was a trade made with uh, the Avalanche and a trade made with the Islanders. The Barons actually had a a miniature spurt. They won five out of eight games going into the All-Star break. It looked like maybe they could challenge for the new wild card playoff spot. The wild card was added that year in the NHL and the Barons were on the fringe of contention for the wild card until early in February when they went on, as as you described, a lengthy six week winless streak. After winning a game early in February, they didn't win another game until after St. Patrick's Day. Wow. And that, of course, destroyed the season. They wound up winning fewer games in their second season than they did in their first. They wound up with fewer points the second season than the first. And, well, they wound up also with uh, about roughly the same average attendance the second season as the first. How, let me ask you this. How did the coach, uh, Jack Evans, respond to all of this? And i got to ask, was he the right coach for this team? Did anyone ever ask that? The odd thing is, and I point this out often in the book because it's just the nature of sports. When a team isn't doing well, the coach or manager finds himself on the hot seat and at no time – In the two years the Barons were in Cleveland, I don't know um, if Jack Evans knew where the bodies were buried or what, but the (laughs) the writers constantly, constantly went out of their way to say, this is not Evans' fault. The fact that the Barons stink is not Evans' fault. He's a good coach. This isn't his fault. 
Yeah, I mean, you had uh, he, he was there both years. You had Bill McCreary was a GM, then Howell comes in to be the GM. You talk about the trade. Maybe Giller knew something. They shouldn't have made the trade. Uh, they made the trade with the Islanders. They made the trade with the Rockies. And like you said, you know, the year comes to an end. Um, they had less wins and less points. Amazingly, less people actually did show up. But I contend when you take a look at the team and after reading your book, I actually think as a whole it was a better team. But, again, less wins, less points. And as the season ended, and rightfully so, most people thought there would be a year three. But it never came to be. And while the guns said, hey, you know, there could be a year three, they did some research. What did that research say? Well, exactly. That is what happened. And as I, as I mentioned at the end of the book, if the $25,000 that the Gunn brothers spent on a survey of Cleveland sports fans had been conducted two years earlier, if George Gunn III had said, let's conduct this survey before we make any decisions on where we want to move the team. Let's see if Cleveland would like to have this team or if Cleveland is prepared to support this team. Think of the millions of dollars that would have been saved. The, right. the, millions, that, the millions that Mel Squig lost, the millions that the Gund brothers lost operating the team in 1977, 78. They paid $25,000 for a sports marketing firm to conduct a survey asking simply, how interested are you in the Cleveland Barons? How interested are you in the National Hockey League? And the exact numbers were never made public, but what the Gunn brothers told us was the survey said Cleveland just is not interested in this team. There just are not enough hockey fans in Northeastern Ohio to support a National Hockey League team. Incredible. A $25,000 survey could have avoided the whole deal. What happened to the Barons after year two? Well, as you said, the prevailing wisdom was Things were really bad this year, but the Gund brothers promised they would give it three years. They did a few things uh, relatively late in the season, which indicated that they were planning on a second season. For example, late in February, they opened a souvenir shop in downtown Cleveland. Yeah, that's right. That would certainly seem to indicate that they're going to proceed with their three-year plan. You open a souvenir shop in the, the downtown shopping district. They provided the league with uh, a list of 50 dates on which they were hoping to potentially get home games the next season. They hired, officially hired Harry Howell as the general manager. Now, when, when they signed Jack Evans to a new contract after the Gunn Brothers had finalized the purchase of the team. Their first order of business was to sign Evans to a new multi-year contract. It was reported by the press that they also signed Howell to a multi-year contract, and that was erroneous. Howell worked the entire 77-78 season on a handshake agreement. Wow. He did not sign, he did not sign a contract until the final game of the year, Fan Appreciation Day at the Coliseum against the Pittsburgh Penguins. During that game, Howell signed a three-year contract as general manager and said to the press at that time, surely this will convince you that the Gun Brothers are in it for the long haul. Why would they hire me now if they weren't in it for the long haul? So they did things which certainly gave the impression that they said three years and they meant three years. But right. that survey changed everything. And I really have no reason to believe the, the survey 
wasn't accurate. All you had to do is look at the number of people in the stands right. to know that there weren't enough hockey. Warren, the, the odd thing was you mentioned some of the big crowds. You mentioned the the one shining moment the Barons had, the night before Thanksgiving, 1977. They had 12,659 people in the building. They beat Montreal 2-1. to one. That was the crowning achievement in two years of Baron Conti. The next game against Pittsburgh, 4,000 people. <laughs> when they did draw big crowds and they did play well, they had over um, 10,000 people the first time Philadelphia came to town and beat them. The next home game, the crowd was 4,000 people. They would put people in the seats occasionally and play well, but then those people left, and hardly any of them ever came back. And who can really understand the reason for that? So 20,000 is spent. The survey says there just aren't enough hockey fans in Northeastern Ohio to support this team. The Guns lost $3 million on the Barons in 1978. And as is, is mentioned in the book, after the announcement was made, and I, I won't go any further than that because uh, I know you haven't gotten to that yet, so I won't, uh, won't jump the gun here, <laughs> but, um, but the Guns ad- admitted that I mean, there had been rumors, Alan Eagleson, Alan Eagleson, the guy who saved the Barons, was also probably their most severe critic in the first couple of weeks of the 1977 season. Eagleson goes public and says, the guns are going to have to fold this team. This team is going to fold. And the guns were furious because they were only a couple of weeks into the season. They got stuff they're trying to do. And here's Alan Eagleson telling everybody, the Barons are doomed. They're going to fold. They're going to fold. They're going to fold. And as it turned out, Eagleson knew exactly what he was talking about. He knew the kind of money the Guns were losing. But at the All-Star break in 1978, the Guns had lost as much money as Mel Swig had lost. The Guns had put aside $2.2 million as operating revenue for the 1977-78 season. And the NHL said, hey, that's great. That ought to be more than enough. So they approved the sale. $2.2 million, that ought to be more than enough. That money had all been spent by the All-Star break. It was gone. And the guns could have done what Mel Swig did and go to the Board of Governors and said, you got to bail us out. But they didn't. They just dug into their personal fortunes and kept paying the bills, and paying the bills, and paying the players until the season was over. But they were they were smart businessmen. Right. And you were not about to lose another three million dollars in nineteen seventy eight, seventy nine. And there just didn't seem to be any reason to believe things were going to improve. No, not there at just all. Didn't seem to be any reason to believe that. So so well I'll I'll let you uh, Well so it, you know it's funny it really happened here. Yeah, it's funny for anybody that's a sports fan of Cleveland teams, your Barons actually sort of still exist in a very roundabout way. They actually play in Dallas as the Stars. Dallas used to be the Minnesota North Stars. And after that second season... The North Stars, also a team that was not exactly killing it on the ice, but playing in Minnesota where hockey is sort of a religion, the Barons wound up merging with the North Stars. How did that come about, Gary? Well, the way it came about is that the Georgetown the third was an avid hockey fan. And every year, he attended the World Hockey Championships, which in 1978 were uh, played in um, Czechoslovakia, I believe. Also attending the World Hockey Championships was Walter Bush, the owner of the Minnesota North Stars. Now, to give you some perspective on how 
terrible the Barons' attendance was, Warren, there were 18 teams in the National Hockey League. The Barons finished 18th in attendance at 227,000. The team next lowest at 17th was the North Stars, but their attendance was 347,000. Back to how far behind the Barons wow. were, and the, 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 the team with the next worst attendance drew 120,000 more fans than the Barons did. So Bush and Gund um, wound up meeting at the uh, World Hockey Championships and started talking about their teams. I don't know which of them came up with the idea, but somebody came up with the idea that maybe if we merged our two terrible teams, we might wind up with one mediocre team that might have a shot at the wild card. And since nobody is going to your games, we'll have the team play in Minneapolis. And they agreed, this is a good idea. And they decided to merge the two teams. They went to the Board of Governors meeting in June, presented the idea to the Board of Governors, and they said, yeah, that just might work. So the Barons merged with the North Stars. The Guns would own 85% of the merged team. So I don't know how much of his ownership mm. Walter Bush sold to the Gun Brothers, but obviously he sold a significant amount of his ownership to them. And the merged team would play in Minneapolis. And that was the end of the Cleveland Barons, the Oakland Seals slash California Golden Seals <laughs> slash Cleveland Barons. Right. And, and, you know, some people probably didn't even know the team left, nor did they know it existed. Hey, when you look back at the whole saga, you could say it all went wrong when Mel Swig decided to move the team to Cleveland from California without doing any market research and without having ever stepped foot in the city of Cleveland. You could also say it all went wrong when the NHL decided to expand to the Oakland, San Francisco area with the Golden Seals. How do you place blame? Should you place blame? Well, I, I agree that, first of all, the Oakland Seals should never have existed. It would appear, and I don't really know anything about that expansion, although, I mean, the NHL went from the original six teams after the 1966-67 season they expanded by six teams. Ultimately, over the next eight years, they expanded by 12 teams, and you just don't expand that fast. You just cannot expand at that rate. As I mentioned in the book, with the coming of the World Hockey Association, hockey went from six major league teams at the end of the 1966-67 season to theoretically anyway, 32 major league teams by 1975. If you consider the World Hockey Association to have been major league, hockey expanded from six major league teams to 32 in a period of eight years. And that's just insane. Right. So the open fields should never have existed because you look at the attendance figures there. They never averaged more than 6,200 fans per game. So did the NHL do the necessary due diligence and homework before deciding to put a team in Oakland? It would seem that during that expansion frenzy, all you had to do was knock on uh, Clarence Campbell's door and say, hey, I hear the expansion fee is two and a half million. I got it. Give me a team. And they would give you one. <laughs> it seemed to be that way. So I don't think the, the Oakland Seals ever should have existed, but they did. Therefore, um, it just it is mind-boggling to me in the way I phrased it in the book. I think the average person would do more research in buying a used car 
than Mel Swig did in moving <laughs> his multi-million dollar major league sports franchise to Cleveland. No homework at all was done. Very simple. Cleveland has a building. I need a building. I'm moving there. Yeah. Mistake after mistake after mistake. Gary, we... And st- even Swig yeah. himself admitted when, when he sold the bearings and left town, Warren, even Swig admitted, I did not have good information when I moved my team here. Gary, we started the podcast by say, with you saying, you don't even know if people remember the Barons. So let me ask you, does anyone even remember the Barons? Does anyone in Cleveland know that they actually had a team that played in the National Hockey League? I I don't know how many people do. I mean, I can I can tell you this that the Barons are n- never referred to. I don't remember the last time I heard anybody mention the Cleveland Barons in the media, in uh, discussions with uh, people I know or or meet. I have not heard the Cleveland Barons, the NHL Cleveland Barons mentioned in I don't know how long. Honestly, if you were to talk to somebody probably under the age of 40, because the Barons left, what, in 1978, so that's 43 years, okay. Under the age of, say, 35, if you asked your average Cleveland or even your average Cleveland sports fan, even an avid sports fan, under the age of 35, ask them about the Cleveland Barons, I'll bet they'd look at you like, what? Cleveland had a National Hockey League team? Wow. I didn't know that. <laughs> I really believe that. Well, how should the Barons be remembered? Well, they should be remembered. I think the 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 best way of putting it, and the way the way I put it in the book, because I I sincerely believe that the Cleveland Barons should be remembered as a team that never should have existed. They never should have. Incredible, Gary. The you were. You write some great, great books. I've enjoyed reading them. And I got to tell you, this one, the NHL's Mistake by the Lake, A History of the Cleveland Barons, terrific book. I encourage anyone who is a hockey fan who has listened to grab a hold of it. It is really good. Uh, Just go to my uh, website, sportsfh.com. I got links there. Um, to so you could uh, easily get a copy of the book. And Gary, what are you working on now? You got anything cooking now? Well, you know, I it was suggested to me that I ought to write a history of the Cleveland Crusaders. So, so that is in the, in the back of my mind, and I'm I'm working on a, a project, not anything that I would really ever expect. To, to be published other than self-publishing through, uh, through my computer. But I'm writing uh, a history of the Cleveland Rebels of the Basketball Association of America. Interesting, which I combined with the National Basketball League formed the NBA. Exactly. And my my premise is, actually, first of all, I have um, a distant relative who actually played for the, the Cleveland Rebels. But the premise being, from what I have read, Al Sutton owned the Cleveland Rebels <laughs> and folded the, team after, folded the team after one season because... It lost thirty five hundred dollars. Oh my! And I'm thinking that does not make sense to me. Al Sutton was a millionaire. That the Barons could easily have absorbed a loss of thirty five hundred dollars. Sutton owned the arena and needed somebody in there on the nights the Barons weren't playing. So that's why he joined the Basketball Association of America. But if it was just for lack of, for want of $3,500, suppose the Rebels had caught on. Yeah. Then the Cleveland Bears would never have come into being. 
Yeah. And if the Warriors had never existed, then LeBron James would probably never have played basketball here because hopefully the team would not have been as rotten as the Cavaliers were the year LeBron <laughs> came out of high school. And how would basketball history have been changed? And did things turn out the way they did all for want of a lousy $3,500? Fascinating. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. But hey, you never know when something is going to pique your interest and you just dive right into it. I never would have expected, really, to write a book about the Barons. And then it just sort of came to me that, uh, you know, this happened in my lifetime. And, and let's look into this. And the rest is history. History is correct. And you do it well. Gary, thank you so much for joining me on Sports Forgotten Heroes. Um, been a wonderful conversation. Can't appreciate it enough. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for stopping by. Warren, it is always a pleasure. In their first year of play, the Barons went 25, 42, and 13. They scored 240 goals and gave up 292, finishing last in the Adams Division with 63 points and played in front of an average of 6,194 fans. In their second season, 1977-78, the Barons were 22, 45, and 13 for 57 points. They scored fewer goals, 230, and gave up a whopping 325 goals. And they averaged less fans, just barely breaking the 5,000 barrier. Dennis Marook led the Barons in scoring each year. In the 1976-77 season, he tallied 28 goals and 50 assists. And in the 77-78 season, he netted 36 goals and 35 assists. In the Nets, it was all about Gilles Malosh, and he was the man. Malosh was a terrific goalie, just like Marouk was a terrific forward. In the Barons' first year, Malosh was 19-24-6 with a 3.47 goals against average. And in the 77-78 season, he was 16-27-8 with a 3.76 goals against average. In their brief history, Marook, Bob Murdoch, and Chuck Arneson each scored a hat trick. They were the only three to do so, and they each netted one. And the only player to register a penalty shot was Al McAdam, and he scored on it against the Penguins, that's the Pittsburgh Penguins, in a 5-4 loss. Hey, I want to thank McFarland and company for sending me a copy of Gary's book, The NHL's Mistake by the Lake, and of course, I want to thank Gary for spending so much time with us, and thanks to you for listening. And we'll see you next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.